Expanding World in association with the Explorers Club are proud sponsors of this episode of Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, and the Global Exploration Summit, a pioneering endeavor bringing together the world's leading explorers, sharing cutting-edge technology and innovations to propel us toward the next frontier in the future of exploration and to make a difference in the future of humanity. Visit GlexSummit.com to learn more about the Global Exploration Summit and the impactful men and women who are the heart and soul of scientific innovation and exploration. One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Our guest today, Kathy Sullivan, is the first American woman to walk in space, more recently the first woman to dive to the deepest point on Earth, and author of a sensational book called Handprints on Hubble by MIT Press. Welcome to Life's Tough Explorers are Toughy, Tougher. Uh, I was using rougher just because I saw a, a rough roof on your lap, <laughs> Kathy Sullivan. <laughs> Kathy, for, for people who are only um, hearing us, uh, if they hear some growling it's not you it's it's your dog that, that's correct i have young murphy sitting on my lap in hopes that that'll prevent squirrel chases and other louder noises now young murphy is 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 a fairly recent addition to your home is this true uh late 2018 because frankly with my travel and work patterns of years past if i'd gotten the dog before that i'm pretty sure the dog would have uh, had the SPCA sue me for neglect. Yeah, it's it's like when people called uh, child services because you're not around your kids enough. Um, I grew up with dogs and we're having that discussion in our household now. Uh, we have two adopted cats, which are very easy to take care of. But, you know, once you sort of go to the dog mode, it, it does change your plans quite a bit. Yes, well, you know, dogs really need, you know, friends and lovers and cats only need servants. Oh, that, that is so true. You know, um, growing up, it was great. I had outdoor dogs, which no one seems to have anymore. And uh, it was just always such a great feeling when you drive down the driveway, or walk down the driveway. They are so happy to see you. you. I mean, you could just be getting the mail and they're just equally happy to see you. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if you're gone five minutes or five days. It's sort of, I, you were abandoning me and I'm so grateful that you're back. Yeah, it's really fun. So Kathy, this spring, I have to admit, you caught the um, exploration and science world a little by surprise by uh, your trip to the deepest point in the ocean with Victor Vescovo. Uh, how did you pull that off? And it, it was really when COVID was starting to uh, come to our consciousness this spring. And you, you, know, you pulled it off. I, I only heard about it maybe a week before you were about to leave. Yeah, well, Victor had emailed me uh, quite out of the blue. Uh, we, we didn't know each other. We had never met. Uh, I guess it was around, I'm going to say late October or November of, uh, of 18 and said he was, uh, sorry, of 19 and said he was going back to the Challenger Deep uh, in 2020. And he, he wanted to take some notable people to interesting deep points in the ocean. And, and he thought it was really time a woman reached full ocean depth. And he had decided that should be me. So from let's say that was November of uh, 19, forward into 20, you know, the expedition was on and then getting a little more complex and COVID starts to hit really the first, last week of February, first week of March is when I remember you feeling the virus sort of nipping at my heels. Uh, by mid-March, everything had been on my extraordinarily busy calendar through June had evaporated, like I think everybody else's. But um, <clears throat> Victor managed to get uh, the arrangements made and he and his team uh, for the ship to continue on and she got into Guam 
and you know testing regimes were coming along uh, well enough. So the deal was uh, a pod of us met in uh, in Arizona, where there was a quick turn rapid turnaround testing lab that could handle. I think it was the six of us that went through. We flew in one day, got tested the next morning, had results by that supper time. Got on a Cracker Dawn airplane the next day and headed out through Hawaii to Guam. The health authorities uh, on Guam at that time uh, had set a regime up that if you could show, it's now familiar to people, if you arrived with a valid test result that was done within the preceding 72 hours, you could forego the otherwise mandatory hotel quarantine. So we had those certificates and we had a representative of the ship's agent company standing right by the health authority saying, look, these people are going from your desk to my van to a ship not pass and go, not even stopping at 7-Eleven along the way. And so we essentially went into a quarantine bubble aboard ship, which was known to be virus free. So it was a bit of a challenge and it was eerie odd in all the airports, of course, because airports that if you're familiar with them, you're familiar with navigating, feeling like a salmon swimming upstream in the concourses, Honolulu and Tokyo and Narita, and they were ghost towns, total ghost towns. So Kathy, I'm kind of curious, you had to have been vetted by somebody because let's face it, when you, you go on an expedition, you got to choose your partners well. I know that um, you are friends with Don Walsh, the first man, co-first man to go down to the deepest point. Um, and I'm assuming he's friends with Victor Vescovo. Was there any of Don interceding and saying, hey, Kathy's solid. I mean, there's got to be some vetting because this is so different from the astronaut program where you really look through psychological training and, and, and screening people. Yeah, I honestly don't know all the details. Don certainly uh, did already know Victor. He'd been out at sea for the Challenger deep uh, leg of the five deeps expedition in 2019. Um, when I asked Victor about that, well, when we were actually in the submersible heading down, uh, what Victor said was, as he realized that was something he wanted to do, I mean, remember he now knows Don Walsh and he knows people in the deep sea arena from academics to the submersible manufacturers at Triton and the designers. And Victor said, he, he just started asking around through the network of people he now was acquainted with. If I was gonna do this and take the first woman, who, who should be the first woman to the Challenger Deep? You know, whether he's circled back around with uh, someone like Dawn, who does know me pretty well, and asked if she was, you know, squared away or, you know, is she gonna be okay at sea? I don't, I don't know. He just said, no, you're, everyone kept up, everyone was coming up with your name. So we had a, we swapped a couple of emails. Uh, he knows I have a Navy background as well. So I've got a, a lot of operational experience, uh, but I honestly don't know, you know, how much of my background he pulled and how, how much he worried about that. There had to be a certain giddiness about it. You know, you describe it as a spy novel, but let's face it, when you're invited to go on a really cool trip, you know, anywhere, uh, there's always that excitement of, you know, where the brain goes and sort of the, the planning on that. It, it had to have, um, that had to be a refreshing feel for you. Well, my brain went a couple of places. And of course, the first phase of all this is happening before COVID has, is in anybody's awareness. Um, so my very first thing was, I mean, I had not followed the Five Deeps expedition all that carefully. I knew Victor had succeeded. So, you know, this is a pretty squared away outfit if they can pull off those five dives. Uh, but my first thought went to calling Don Walsh, who I knew had been at sea with them, and you know, there was a bit of reverse vetting too. I mean, are these guys, this is a, this is a well-to-do adventurer, right? And some of those guys are really squared away and solid and some of them are you know, not as squared away and solid. So who is, who's this guy, Victor? And is he really got, he and the team, do they really have their act together? Are they, is the operations, the design is clearly robust and safe given the number of dives it's already done, but how about shipboard operations? And you know, handling a sub over the side is, it can be a very dicey thing in any kind of sea condition. So I don't know how much Victor checked me out and, and I certainly didn't you know, pull FBI files on him. <laughs> uh, but, but I asked around because you're gonna be at sea for 10 days and a small craft for a dozen hours. And I would have to say, and you know, just purely from a professional uh, standpoint and looking at backgrounds, you both have 
probably the most incredible resumes that I've seen. And, you know, Victor is Stanford, MIT, Harvard Business School, uh, climbed Everest. I mean, he's a pretty accomplished guy, same similar military background to you. There had to be at least that kind of meeting of the mind. This is a, a pretty substantial person. Oh, I think once we finally met, uh, I certainly felt a very, very quick, solid rapport. Uh, I think some of it is sort of the confidence in the shared characteristics of someone who has succeeded uh, at that kind of list of achievements as he's done. And, and I suspect he could recognize the same in me. But there also was just a lot of, I think, you know, we're, we're ops geeks, we're analytical types, uh, we're just pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, not, neither of us actually is any kind of huge overweening ego. So it's, uh, I, it just, it clicked really nicely. It was a delight to be at sea with him and we've stayed in touch. So I, I'm happy to consider him a, a friend at this point. I, I think, you know, you're, you're both, if I, I were to sort of pick the next sort of branches of evolution, I, I might actually put the both of you on there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my, just my gut feeling of looking at the operation, comparing this to your first uh, flight um, into space versus that, I would imagine that uh, you're probably a little more relaxed as a person, just sort of on the nature of what you're doing. I think there's got to be a difference between sitting on a rocket that can explode and there's a calculable chance versus going down in a sub that seems to have a pretty good safety record. Yeah, the, I mean, they're very different, you know, risk environments in a lot of ways. Uh, I think definitely the explosive potential of getting off this planet is, you know, that's clearly the most viscerally daunting kind of thing. It's that things are gonna go really bad, really fast if something starts going bad there. Um, and, it, you know, deep submersible dive uh, is more of an elevator ride than a, than a bomb. So, but the, the other big factor for me was uh, I had really substantial responsibilities for the operation of the vehicle and the operation of equipment aboard it on the space shuttle. And the submersible, Victor submersible is a certified single pilot craft. So really, you know, all I needed to do was you know, be good company, uh, be prepared to operate the manipulator arm, uh, make some useful observations. And so in terms of you know, intellectual burden and everything else, it was, it was kind of go along for the ride and be good company. You know, just so people know, that's not me actually growling at, at Kathy. That's that's a dog showing a just pleasure of having <laughs> it while it's it's walk time. Kathy, I loved your your book, Handprints on Hubble, and the part I and, and I found it refreshingly accessible. And what I found uh, so wonderful about it was that, you know, right now people look at the Kathy Sullivan American hero, but it didn't start that way. You know, everybody takes a first step. And your first step started in Patterson, New Jersey. And, you know, you didn't grow up with a silver spoon in your, 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 your mouth. And you, you had challenges right from the start. As everybody does. Uh, you know, I, it's about becoming uh, something with your life, not about sort of plopping into it. You don't get beamed into uh, being 60 or 70. You have to walk every step of that. That's both the challenge and the fun and the opportunity of it. Uh, I was... I'm not silver spoon kid by any means, but you know, a comfortable family and very good health, supportive parents. So an upbringing that uh, let me be adventurous and curious, uh, that went a long way to inoculating me against you know peer pressures and opinions that often start to swirl around in everybody's head in their teen years, but in particular that can beset uh, teenage girls and push them into, you know, don't be too smart or don't, you know, the main thing is be popular. So pull back on your potential. Uh, and I kind of blasted through more of that than maybe some do, but I did always feel, uh, you know, a freedom to explore anything that interested me. And I think the little small baby steps in learning how to tackle a new challenge that our parents made available to us. You know, I, I think, I think there's a, parallel to working out at the gym here, believe it or not, because I think if you can start with little steps, small risks, like, can I get my tricycle to the corner and back uh, and gain some confidence and learn the, the mental processes that are going into that, the more of that you can do, the more you're prepared for a next ch challenge or a next one beyond that. You gain a strength and an agility and you gain a confidence that lets you take on different challenges and larger challenges. 
But, you know, I noticed um, you've met my daughter before. She's turning 13 this um, June. And so it's the analogy of the gym is okay, but now throw in um, hormones, peer pressure, as you mentioned it. Did you find in, in your case, you had to have been a great student. Is that where you sort of found your security blanket? I always, I did always love reading. And I mean, I was just insatiably curious. So school to me was, it was something I had to do, but it was also kind of a smorgasbord of things I didn't know that were being served up to me. And it was fun to take them in. But, you know, those pressures, I think it was, I think it was sixth grade. I can remember fifth or sixth grade. I can remember pretty vividly. And I'm pretty sure it was a geometry class, which I found to be great fun puzzle solving. And so I would, I think always eagerly have my hand in the air when the teacher asked a question. And I can remember very vividly one particular day where I you know, threw my hand up in the air and suddenly realized it was clearly not really welcome among the other kids in this class that my hand was always in the air. And it was this, I, this is feeling not comfortable and suddenly to stand out by always having my hand in the air. And I, pretty well stopped putting my hand in the air at that point, but I was just stubborn enough that I answered every question in my own head. So I didn't shut down. I just said, great, I don't need to signal to you guys that I'm liking this and I'm having fun with it, to heck with you. But I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep grabbing every bit of learning I can. I'm gonna keep challenging myself on every question I can. Uh, if it's bugging you that I'm overly eager about it, yeah, I can hide that for you and carry on but I'm not stopping. H hasn't that been really identified more so culturally with young women than it does with young men in society that, you know, and I've heard this from so many women that they, they felt if they were acting too smart, they would, you know, be unpopular and being unpopular is not fun. No, I think, I think that's exactly right. I, I do suspect on average it cuts Heart more harshly against young girls in those teenage years than against boys, because uh, you know the, the girls and boys are at very different points in their developmental arc in their early teen years, as as plenty of research shows and probably every parent knows. Um, but yeah, you you're looking to be popular. You're trying to figure out your place in in the world, including socially. And of course, so many signals, so many signals are sent to young girls in our popular culture that the important thing is to have a boyfriend, to have the dates, to be at the dance. Yeah, that, that's sort of, that's how you know you're okay. Uh, so if you don't have those, it, it poses some challenges for you, certainly. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely know that feeling. And, um, you know, I went to an all boys school, which is a good thing, bad thing. But I, I felt at that time, just so wanting to get out in the world and meet other people. Do you remember who your best friend was in high school? Uh, yeah, um, I ran with a small, a small gaggle of the smart girls. Uh, and, mo and most of us, I mean, I'm talking like four others, most of us are at least episodically still in touch. But my all around best friend was ended up being my tennis partner. Uh, and we came from kind of fairly different parts of town. Her family was more a country club family. And I think a, a step or so uh, more well to do than we were in some respects. Uh, and we first were competitors in the tennis class and in our, each of our, our little social bubbles thought the other one was a jerk. And then finally, <laughs> finally, but we were both very good players. So finally we end up squared off against each other in the singles final. And I think it was when we walked to the net to shake hands before the match, each of us individually discovered that we thought that what our gaggle was saying about the other one was kind of baloney. <laughs> it was, so we've both been fed a line by our support circle about the other person. And when you actually met the other person, you said, oh, no, you're actually, you're actually great fun. And we're, we're very close friends to this day. Well, that, that's great. Uh, my best friend, Rick Barth, I will say this, he went to Princeton and went to Harvard Medical School, and now he teaches at Dartmouth. And I met him on the first day of football tryouts in the ninth grade. And, you know, there's something you hit, hit off about that person. And you, you at that time, exploring life is kind of interesting because you're neither fish nor fowl, and you're just trying to figure it out. And I was lucky. I, 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 for my best friend, I had a really smart guy 
and I think he he was very ethical and, and it was a pretty good guy. So I, I feel very lucky about that. Kathy, were you competitive as, as a kid? I, I would imagine going into the space program, first woman class, you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah, I, I was always competitive with myself to see what I could do, but I was never the kind of competitor that you know, would connive and trash talk I didn't care about taking you out. I just cared about seeing how well I could do and what would it what would it take to what would it take to get to the top of that hill? What would it take to you know win win a match? You know what? How far up a tennis ladder could I get? But it was it never was focused on someone else. Just a curiosity. It's a curiosity about achievement, about what what's it like to do that and you know how well can I do it? And that's always been what drove me. So you were getting your PhD in Canada, uh, I believe in Halifax, uh, when you applied for the space program, how was how were you contacted? How did you first know you made it in? Was it a phone call, a letter? Uh, yeah, the, the announcements about uh, our selection were made by the, you know, the big boss that was going to be our big boss when we all showed up in Houston. Uh, and it, the typical pattern of let's call all these people before the press release hits you know, on whatever day that was in January of 1978, uh, I, I was living in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia at the time. And the important part of that is that Halifax is one hour ahead of East Coast time. So NASA, of course, has this whole press release timed to whatever time it was, East Coast time. And this guy has 35 people to call that are scattered across, certainly across all of the United States. And I think one or two were in Europe someone was far out in the Pacific with the military. Uh, so I, I'm told I got the first phone call because I was up earliest being an hour ahead of all the other American folks. So, I, you know, when you're rooming in a small cheap apartment with three other gals, cause you're all broke uh, there, and, it's, and it's the 1970s, there's one phone in the hallway. Uh, and I think for all of us, parents never called us cause they never knew where we would be. So we, it was really only ever outbound calls. So you can imagine that phone rings unexpectedly at 7.30 in the morning. And all of us stuck our heads out of our bedroom, I think, wondering whose family's got an emergency. I mean, it was this sort of, this has got to be bad news. Uh, and one of my roommates picked it up her, closest to the phone. And next thing I know, she's got her hand over the speaker part of the handset. And she's looking at me with these saucer sized eyes and, said, and sort of mouths. It's for you. It's someone from NASA. So that's how I found out. <laughs> oh, right. Come on, Kathy, you have, I know you're such, you're such a low key person on everything you do, but even for the most low key person, you know, that's gotta be the words that you, your knees get weak over. Well, it was really funny. The guy, you'd have to appreciate the, the character who was making these calls. He is one of the most, you think I'm low key. This guy is speaks low and speaks slow. And you know, he's got the least inflection in his voice under any circumstance of anybody I've ever met. And so, you know, he says, Hi, this is this is George Abbey. And, and the wheels are kind of turning, and I'm oh, oh yeah, that's right, because it's been months ago. It's you know, months ago that this interview happened. Uh, and in this very stunningly laconic way. He, I mean, he literally said, well, uh, kind of I'm calling to just see if um, you're still interested in coming to work for us. And my reaction was, you sound as excited as if you're inviting me to bag groceries at the local market. <laughs> and yet you're offering me something that's turning my life. You know, I don't even know, how, it's utterly transforming my life in ways I know I can't imagine. And you sound about as excited as the grocery store manager. It was just, the cognitive dissonance was just huge. And every, every one of my classmates who's ever talked about or written it has very much the same experience. Life is, you know, a hand grenade just went off and your life is falling into new pieces. And this guy just sounds like a grocery store manager. So you hang up the phone. What, what's the first words you say? Come on, Kathy. I don't, I don't, I don't remember what the first, I, I'm sure my roommates were all out in the hallway. Uh, I, I suspect what I 
said was I'm in because they, they knew the story. They knew that what had been happening. We talked a bit uh, between the interview back in November and now about, you know, what did I really want it? Can I really do it? All that kind of stuff. So they, they knew that I was hoping I would get it, kind of hoping, but not daring to hope that I would get it. Uh, so probably all I said was I'm in. And of course, the whole rest of the day, every, I, you know, I, I got, went down to the lab. They didn't tell me to do anything. They just told me the press release was going to come out. So the next thing I was really utterly unprepared for was the explosion in the press at, it was probably 11, I suspect it was 11 o'clock in Halifax, probably was a 10 a.m. press release. Uh, and, you know, all of the Canadian press just goes bonkers. One of these, this is super big news, new astronauts, oh man, and one of them's living with us kind of thing. So, uh, it was it was quite a circus in my laboratory for the whole rest of that day. Who who was the first person you called up to tell the news? Um, again, I, you know that the, the, all the rest of that day is a total blur. Um, you know, it's four thirty in the morning where my parents are living, so I'm quite sure I did not call them at four thirty in the morning. And oh, I would have. <laughs> But I, you know, I got that's what I worked on is getting through to them so that they wouldn't be surprised uh, by a press release and they would hear that's it. Gotta, look, for every kid, that's the best feeling in the world. Come on, to call up your parents with that kind of news, that's that's got to be, you know, a part of you that because you know your parents, you always seek your parents' approval. And to say, I've got it, it's got to be a wonderful moment. Well, yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd had a couple of conversations along the way in the selection process that you know, that were along that same line. I mean, you know, as excited as they were for me to be applying, my mother in particular was just a little bit daunted that when her daughter finishes grad school, she's either going 6,000 feet deep in the ocean in a submersible or 200 miles up in a spaceship. And, you know, I, I'm sure she wished I'd found something exciting on the surface instead. <laughs> and But your dad was in the aerospace industry. So, you know, he, he's got to sort of have an understanding of the process a little bit. Well, I think not of the astronaut selection process. I think what was, uh, you know, what's going through his mind is he kind of, he knows too much, right? He he knows how coveted and exclusive becoming an astronaut is, but he also knows all about how rockets blow up. So sometimes I, I, it doesn't doesn't you know, pay to know too much. Yeah, I understand that. In fact, uh, in your book, you mentioned that um, on launch day or soon before you have the what if conversation, and I believe you had that with your father. Yeah, I had it with either my father or my brother before every one of my flights. The incident that I write about in the book is with my dad before my third flight, because that that walk was part of all the events that led to my switching gears and going from NASA over to NOAA. But you you not only have it with uh, your immediate family or parents or or siblings and spouses, but you know the office, the astronaut office. Is like military squadrons, uh, every uh, astronaut, every astronaut on a crew has another astronaut assigned uh, to be their casualty assistance officer, which means if stuff goes really bad, uh, I'm the one who's going to fetch your belongings and get with to your family and, you know, help them be their conduit for reliable information about what happened and all that stuff and help help them sort through the aftermath of you not coming home. So you and I both know the three astronauts from the Apollo 11, and there had to be, at least I understand, um, there was competition to see who would be that first person, or at least an expectation. So your group had the first women astronauts. There had to be in the back of your mind, or maybe it's artificial competition created, a little bit of curiosity or anxiety on who that first person to be picked, because that's a historic figure right away. Yeah, well, it's clear that it's clear that the six of us are the six that are being considered, uh, and and <clears throat> and clear that you know one will go before the other five go. All the rest of the equation is not clear. Right? It's, pretty clear that the guy I mentioned before, George Abbey, is going to have a, a significant influence on the choice. Very unlikely that that's not going to be reviewed and maybe modified by others. But uh, you know what's totally unclear, certainly was unclear to, to, to me and I think to any of us, is on what parameters are you being judged, by whom, and, and when. So you know, is it could be, and I think the way most of us felt is, in some sense, uh, everything is part of the test. 
uh, the you know after hours softball is probably in some ways part of the test. Uh, every I, I'm guessing every, you're a good softball player. You look athletic, <laughs> though, Kathy. I'm guessing on the softball portion of the test, you did fine. <laughs> I had a good arm back then for getting balls in from the outfield, there, but, there you but, but you, Richard, you know, it, it, it really wasn't like, you know, it certainly had nothing of the dimension of an organized tournament where you can tell who you're seated off against for the next round. So I think I, I mean, the way I looked at it was the, there's a competition, someone will go first and my best shot of getting that nod is to just always put out the very best I can in every single circumstance. And what else do you do? And so they they announce Sally Ride is on that first one. H how soon after that do you know that you're on, uh, you know, you, you're going to be going for your your historic spacewalk? Um, I think Sally was the announcement about Sally being on the STS-7 flight was sometime in 1982. It was a June 1983 flight. Uh, and it was in the, I think, August time frame of 1983. Uh, that I learned I, that I'd been tapped for what, my first flight. And when that flight was sequenced in the schedule, uh, changed a lot between the day that, that I got the assignment and when we actually flew it. Fl the flight actually moved forward in the sequence because of some commercial satellite failures. Did, did you so find it, that within that group, um, I, I've at least found in my own life, no matter what team I'm on, you know, you mentioned that you have intense personal. Um, competition within yourself and you you know you tend to look at other people's and sometimes say oh really but afterwards you find that there's something very common years afterwards that probably were a stronger bond did you find within that group that group of astronauts that you became closer after the fact or during you know i think you're right there there is a kind of seasoning uh, of the relationship a set of relationships get established when you're in something like that together for a long period of time. But they are, in the moment, they are a mixture of collegial and social and competitive. And, you know, I mean, a really intimately everything moshed up together, a mixture in a lot of cases. Uh, once, you know, once you move beyond that uh, and you're not pure competitors anymore, uh, then all the things the common threads of all the things that you were part of that you shared, uh, they become what you really appreciate and treasure. And so, yeah, I think it, uh, and I've heard Apollo, the, some of the Apollo and Mercury astronauts talk about that. You were, you know, collegial competitors, but harshly at it in the moment. And, you know, now we're just buds that can talk about and joke about uh, all the craziness that we were in together back in the program. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. I, I find with guys and, 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 Maybe it's different in the space program. There is that testosterone issue. And, and I found on mountaineering expeditions that I've been on that women tend to be more supportive of each other in terms of teammates. I, I've really found that true even within sports. There's less of the me in, in women than it is in men. Is that a fair statement to say? Yeah, I think it's quite accurate to say. I mean, a really good friend of mine in oceanography, a man a bit older than I, he tells a great story about his experience with that. And he hated, he always hated the cruise planning meetings because it was all screaming and yelling and insulting the other guy's work. I mean, you're, you're competing for every little bit of ship time. And every day when you review what happened the day during the day and replan for the next day, every one of them was a shouting match. You know, Richard's equipment is crap and his science is garbage. Don't give him any of tomorrow, give it to me. And he goes out to sea late in his career for the first time on an expedition that's led by a woman. So he hated the fighting. He's not that kind of personality. He hated that, but he was proud of the caliber of science that came out of it. And his conclusion was, this is the necessary path to exquisite science. Then he goes to sea on this expedition led by a woman. And he's, he's shocked at the first overnight planning meeting as that as he put his first observation was, no one was yelling. <laughs> everyone, everyone got to complete their sentence. People were actually listening to each other. And a couple days in, he realized this was far better science being done at sea than he had ever seen before in the combative mode. So you know, there is more than one style to achieve excellence. Uh, it's definitely true. And I do think women on average 
tend towards a, an inquisitive mutual learning, co common purpose mutual learning, as opposed to, ha ha, I won. Kathy, I, I've already thought of the, the, the title for your next book, The Path uh, to Enlightenment with Kathy. <laughs> Listen, we Hardly. have a few more minutes and I have so many questions for you because uh, you and I generally, when we talk, we talk about um, structural uh, governmental issues at the Explorers Club and we don't get to talk about the fun stuff like exploration. I had the pleasure of standing next to you two marches ago when we had eight Apollo astronauts and I think about 24 other astronauts who people have been in, in space on stage. I always find the perspective of backstage so much more interesting than uh, sitting in a seat, right? I get antsy sitting in a seat. You and I were standing next to each other and these, I, I, I would imagine the world of exploration, the Apollo astronauts are the top of the pyramid. I mean, that's the biggest thing. And so, you and I were next to each other and literally these people brushed by us, the Buzz Aldrin's, the Al Warden's, all of those people. Mike and Collins. Mike Collins. I mean, and I, I, I enjoyed actually watching your expression as much as the audience because you, you were there in a, in a very quiet thing. We were behind them. And yet I did see, you know, I have to admit your eyes were moist. And so- <laughs> What was going through your mind at that point? Could you believe that you were there? Did your life flash before you? You know, it was just such a wonderful moment. It was a really fabulous evening. Uh, and there were a couple things going through my mind. Uh, one was, you know, these, these are my guys and this is my tribe. Uh, and just the, my, the pride in them and my affection for many of them. I know some of them better than others. Um, so there was that, uh, and there was still this, you know, little little kid in candy shop sense of, and how did it end up that I am now one of them? Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not in the audience. Uh, I'm not just watching them on television. I moved from spectator to participant, in the same a different chapter of the same grand adventure that they were in, and and it was a spectacular opportunity to have, uh, and and that, wow, now I I get to be on stage as the honorary, direct, honorary chair of the Explorers Club, welcoming them as my friends and our guests. And, and how cool is that? And then of course, one of my other special favorite moments was that one of the, uh, one of the more recent astronauts accompanying them was Julie Payette from Canada, mm -hmm. Canadian Space Agency, who at the time was the governor general of Canada, which meant she's the chief executive of a country. So, you know, the senior most figure in the room was this diminutive woman, Julie Payette. Uh, uh, so I blew up, I really, I gave her whole honorific title to the audience because she deserved to have uh, that recognition uh, mentioned in front of everybody there. So I, all of that was just super fun to me. You know, the women arriving in a program, moving on, uh, achieving leadership roles, uh, these guys, all of whom are, you know, have just been gracious and supportive to all of us young folks as we came up behind them. All of that was kind of flowing through my mind. You know, I keep quoting your book, but I think when you were a kid, you always said that uh, reading was the first place that took you traveling. And you've got to pinch yourself a little bit because from that little girl, that little tomboy, as you describe yourself, who grew up in the Sputnik era, you know, you saw all of those, you're the right age to see all of those things. And so now you read those books and there are little girls, I know because I have a little girl and I have little boys and they read, they are now traveling through you. That's gotta, you know, I don't know if it ever hits the enormity of you or it's just part of your life now, but there's gotta be a reflective moment in saying, wow, I was that little girl. Yeah, those are, those are really wonderful moments. And, uh, you know, and now and then you get a chance to you know, touch a little more you meet a youngster at a, after giving a talk or some correspondence. And I remember many years ago now, I exchanged a letter with a young uh, Caribbean girl uh, and just, you know, 
want to be an astronaut, everyone laughs at me. I think she was early teens, it's kind of just what you would expect. And I don't remember exactly what I wrote back to her, but probably things like what I said about myself. Yeah, ignore them, they're the peanut gallery. No one gets to edit what you're interested in. Uh, and about six years later, she wrote me again uh, to just check in with where she was. And she had carried on and she'd gotten to university and she was getting a technical degree and she wasn't, she now saw other prospects for her career, hadn't given up on astronaut yet, but she wouldn't even have been there without that bit of encouragement uh, from someone with some standing that said, no, no, carry on, carry on. And then probably my favorite story of that is concerns another astronaut, Megan MacArthur, uh, who was a undergrad at UCLA planning to go into aerospace engineering because she'd always wanted to be an astronaut. But then she found this submarine competition and she was really liking the marine sciences. And so when I meet her at this competition, she's betwixt to between about, will I lose the astronaut op option if I go with the marine stuff? I do love that more. I absolutely do not remember. I mean, I sat and had a hot dog with her on a beach table for you know 30 minutes. And then it, I completely forgot that event until a mutual friend reminds me right before her first flight uh, about that event on the beach and that this was pivotal. That 20 minute, 30 minute conversation was pivotal in Megan's decision-making. And so we, Megan and I have had this very fun book bookend discussion several times that she would say, I, I mentored her. And I guess it was a moment of mentoring but it was a flash. And I think all of us, Richard, you too, you, you're an accomplished explorer and media personality. And sometimes we have you know, a, a momentary contact with some young person that we don't think we mentored them, but they took something from us. They got an insight or took a note or spotted something. And I think the more that we're aware, mentorship doesn't have to be a handshake, a written agreement, a scheduled appointment. Mentorship is simply being an example. You're getting me uh, all, all teary, teary eyed over, over here. You know, most people, when they see you, they see you at an official press conference. They see you at a black tie event. That story of you having a hot dog on the bench reminds me of a story. And I guarantee you won't even remember this, but you were speaking at the Explorers Club, I'll say in 2004 or so. And uh, you spoke to the audience. And you could see the wait staff were normally not looking at lectures, sort of craning their heads uh, <laughs> around the door. And I remember after your lecture, you went back to where they were doing um, all, busing all the dishes and trays and you took pictures with them. And you, you probably spent about a half hour talking to them. And I, I thought that was um, one of the most wonderful things because for each one of those people, that was the highlight, I guarantee, of their your year, the most famous person they'd ever met. And you spoke to them in a way that didn't make them feel lesser than you. It, and that's the Kathy Sullivan that I sort of want to leave the audience off uh, with today. Kathy, you are such an accomplished person. You've done so much for so many people. And, and I feel really, I haven't always been on the, on the, um, happy side of conversations we've had. And I'll keep that a private conversation between <laughs> you and I. You know what I mean. But really, the world is a better place for having you in it. So, Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. So did I, Richard. I look forward to having some time together in person in the future. Absolutely. Now take that dog for a walk. All right. 